Yep. So I know him to be a man of courage and a man of faith and a man uh, with a heart for people. So I, it's uh, a true honor to uh, introduce uh, Senator Patrick Colbert. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody here at Medefco. I, and by the way, if, you, if everybody can hear me, I, I might not use the mic if that's all right, because I'm already mic'd on this, and I'm worried a little bit about this thing called feedback. Um, so uh, although I'm a big uh, fan of uh, First Amendment rights for redress of grievances, that's not the type of feedback I'm talking about. Um, I uh, want to thank, for, uh, thank John for pulling this on, and Kathy, thank you very much. I don't know where you disappeared to. Oh, there. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting us out here, and I uh, want to thank uh, Senator Jack Brandenburg for all of his uh, service. We got a good conservative in this area representing you all up in Lansing, and uh, it really helps. I wish we had more. <laughs> uh, but. I don't know if you've been paying attention to what's going on over in the House, but there are a lot of good conservatives over in the House, and there's a lot of good policies that uh, we're going to go through some growing pains or whatever on it, but I'm telling you right now, we have a very good cast of characters out there, which bodes well for the farm team, for the Senate, and for future offices. It's, uh, for me, it's very encouraging. Last session, we, used to, we had maybe 20 conservatives and 43 wobblies. This time, we have 20 wobblies and 43 conservatives, which bodes well for a lot of things like health care reform. And matter of fact, this uh, year, in this budget cycle, we have some good news to report. And I'll talk about that a little bit in, in, as we go on. I do want to uh, recognize a couple other folks who are going to be uh, joining me today. And uh, Dr. Paul Thomas is going to be talking about direct primary care. He's with Plum Direct. <laughs> and Victoria? Yeah, Victoria and, uh, is the first time I've ever worked with her up on, on one of these town halls, but she's representing Curo, which is one of the health care ministries that are uh, authorized under the Affordable Care Act. <coughs> yeah, um, I, uh, so we've been doing these health care town halls all across the state. Uh, back, I think our earliest one was back in 2014. And we passed legislation back in 2014, now known as Public Act 522 of 2014. And fundamentally, all it did was say that direct primary care services are not an insurance product. Pretty much like oil changes aren't something that you pay for out of auto insurance. The same idea. Stuff that you're going to on a regular basis isn't a matter of risk management. It's a matter of going off and doing the responsible thing. And, uh, and so th the... Uh, the goal is to, you know, everything that you're hearing on the national landscape right now uh, with health care is all about cost shifting, right? Even the, most, the latest bill called the American Health Care Act, it didn't actually go off and look at reducing the cost of care. It actually just looked at shifting it, maybe filling a few gaps and tweaking around the edges. They talked about uh, block grants for Medicaid expansion, but they, uh, there's two ways of doing that. They, took, they did the bad way. Um, and, uh, but at least they're talking about it. And I'm here to say there's still hope. We got a lot of folks up in the federal government now that, um, now especially the occupant of the White House, that opens a door to a lot of health care reforms that if things would have gone the other way in the election, we wouldn't have had those doors open to us. And so tonight, I, I kind of want to change the typical uh, mainstream media narrative, which is, uh, about all the things that are going wrong with health care and then focus on some solutions that actually work with health care that have been promised and we've shown, demonstrated that we can lower the cost of health care by 20 to 60 percent while actually improving the quality of care. How many of you heard that message out on the news and every, they're all talking about it, right? Yeah. No, they're not. And they should be. And there's one place, I, I, I must have been a good friend of mine, Dr. Josh Umber is uh, he's a doctor out of Wichita, Kansas. He's with a company called Atlas MD. How many of you guys watch Hannity? Oh, yeah. So if you've watched Hannity, you've probably seen Josh on, or if you've listened to his radio show, you've probably heard Josh on. I was watching Huckabee one day after, you know, we were in the middle of this Medicaid expansion fiasco, and um, I uh, was uh, saying we need to promote free market reform so we can 
lower the overall cost of care because there's two ways of improving and expanding access to care for those who can't afford it, right? One is to take money from one group of people and use it to subsidize the cost for somebody else. The other is to lower the cost of care for everybody. Yeah. So I chose the latter route. Unfortunately, our state legislature and the governor chose the former route. Um, there's, uh, so I'm going to be talking about an element of the solution that I was pushing to actually go off and help us expand access to care without expanding Medicaid. And uh, um, it all started uh, with a phone call from Dr. Josh Umber, because I was watching him on Huckabee one day, or watching his partner, Doug Nunemaker, and uh, there are three doctors talking about something unique. And I, I've been looking for free market ideas that were really good, and they had it with this direct primary care services. I called up these docs afterwards, and um, the only one who returned my call was Dr. Josh Umber. And uh, we, our first phone call was about 45 minutes long, and uh, I knew this guy had his finger on the pulse of something truly amazing. And uh, we're going to talk about exactly what that is, and Dr. Paul Thomas is a great advocate on behalf of direct primary care. He's actually a practicing direct primary care physician out of Plum Direct, so uh, he knows of what he speaks, and he knows what the... Uh, ability are to actually save it and he can talk about why it actually saves money. So I just wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the healthcare landscape before we get going. But um, I want to, this is all once again part of this evangelism tour. We've passed all the legislation we ever need to pass, frankly, around this. Now it's a matter of telling people about it. And I'm putting a lot of miles on my car and a lot of miles on my transmission that just gave out on the way here to get that word out. So. Um, all I had to do nowadays is hit the reset button, so it's working fine. <laughs> All right, so a key concept as we're discussing healthcare today, though, is this diagram right up here. Seems kind of simple, but sometimes it can get lost in the weeds, especially when I'm trying to explain this on the radio without a chart. Um, so if you think of a health plan as having two primary components, one is primary care, the other is catastrophic care. So primary care is the stuff, the routine stuff like we were talking about, like your oil changes and filling up the car with, with gas. Catastrophic care is when things go bump in the night, you get hit by a beer truck or you have chronic illness. Um, it's analogous to a car getting in an accident or maybe losing your transmission. <laughs> um, so uh, we're going to talk, direct primary care obviously fits into the primary care area. Catastrophic care, which is um, where uh, Victoria from Curo is going to talk about one of the catastrophic care options that uh, can be used to lower the overall cost of care. But these are two areas that you don't hear anywhere in the DC um, inside the Beltway it, discussions on it um, because there aren't a lot of special interests going off and, go. and pushing for this. Um, the special interests we should be focused on are the 10 million citizens here of the, citizen, uh, the state of Michigan and that's why we're going off in this evangelism mode. So key concept, primary care, catastrophic care. Now before we go further, how many of you guys have heard Milton, of Milton Friedman? Yep. All right, I'm in the right spot. Um, as somebody who came out of the Rattle With Us Tea Party, we were doing all kinds of educational surveys and Milton Friedman would come up quite a bit. So I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, kind of way of viewing economic transactions. And I'm going to talk about it in context of healthcare, but I would, I would uh, uh, submit that this also applies to education. This also applies to any government transaction. But we're going to talk about it, uh, you know, in, in healthcare, and we're going to start out talking it in broad terms. So, first of all, there's three basic types of economic transactions. There's a first person transaction where I buy something with my own money for myself. I'm concerned about quality and I'm concerned about cost, right? We all know this, right? Second person transaction, all right? That's when I'm buying something for somebody else um, with my own money. So I'm concerned about cost, it's my own money, but quality, you know, there's a reason why people re-gift, right? Um, third person transaction or third party is when I'm using somebody else's money to buy something for somebody else. Uh, cost consciousness is pretty low, quality consciousness is pretty low, and guess what? All government transactions are third-party transactions. Um, a little side note here, I, this is also one of the reasons why I don't believe you can separate social issues from fiscal issues. Because the only way that you get a third-person transaction that values what a, we value for ourselves is if we actually love our neighbors as ourselves, 
What a concept, right? I wish somebody would have told me that a while back ago. Uh, but it really comes down to the fact that we have to go off and have a servant's heart and look out what's f for what's best for other people. That's the only way this works out. Now, I don't know if you've looked around the landscape of politics nowadays, but there isn't a lot of that loving your neighbor as yourself going on right now, right? Which, as a, somebody who came out of the Tea Party, is another reason why I'm such an advocate for limited government. <laughs> so the more we limit this, the better. So this is a kind of a basic framework for the next couple slides that I'm going to go through. Ultimately, what we're looking for, the gold standard, if you actually want to lower the cost of health care and you want to improve the quality, you want to get this down to a first party transaction. And we're going to talk about where we see that in the healthcare landscape now. So under an insurance model, no, nope, you don't get it there. Those are all third party transactions, right? But if you have no insurance, and that's what direct primary care is, that's, that's actually where you get into a first party transaction because now it is me as a patient enrolling directly with a doctor in a contractual agreement, service agreement, very transparent. I say, here's the money I'm gonna be providing you. In exchange, I get a transparent list of services that are gonna be provided by my primary care physician. So that's a first party transaction. And also, you can always go off books and do cash services and you can ask physicians and service providers for what's their cash price. Um, so there are options along those lines. Um, Let's go over to the catastrophic care side of the fence again. So where can we find, where, what's, oh, <laughs> well, where can we find somebody for the food? <laughs> all right, so where can we find a first party transaction? Well, I want to start off, first of all, by an understanding of a qualified health plan. How many of you guys have ever heard that term, qualified health plan? All right, that's defined under section 1301 of this wonderful bill called the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> um, Inside qualified health plan, if you have a qualified health plan, the IRS will not come and knocking at your door at midnight and saying you owe us more taxes. All right? That's how you keep from being penalized under the Affordable Care Act. All right? Under there, in this section 1301, there's a variety of options that are specified. One is an ex exchange-based plan, so you go to healthcare.gov. Those are for for-profit insurers, and I don't know if you've noticed, but the number of for-profit insurers on the exchanges is doing a nosedive. They're not, they're disappearing. Um, there's also uh, an area for nonprofit insurers and that's called, that's for co-ops. They're called the uh, consumer operated and oriented plans. These are failing left and right as well under the Affordable Care Act. Then there's another one that's failing, although people on the left would want you to believe that this is the salvation at the end of the tunnel. This is called community health insurance and that's government insurance, that's single payer but nobody's using it because nobody wants it. There's all these other options, and they may not be too enamored with some of these, but they're not going there at all. <laughs> so the last option that's specified under 1301 is something called ERISA-based or self-funded insurance plans. Now, usually we have a segment where we talk about that in detail today. Tonight, we're not going to really drill down into that, but if you're a small or mid-sized employer, this is a good option to go look into. There are, what you need in order to execute that is something called a third party administrator. In particular, if you go for an independent third party administrator, that would be good. Um, if you want more information on that, contact my, me or my office afterwards. By the way, where's Penny? Penny, 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 is she outside? Yeah. All right, my in-district manager is here, Penny Kreider, so she can help out with any questions that you have on uh, on follow-ups. So we, we typically have some folks that can talk specifically about third-party insurance and I can answer some questions on that as well, considering it's my ninth time through this and I should know it by now. So um, uh, there's other, the other options you have for healthcare are Medicaid and Medicare. Um, and, uh, but I'm gonna go into the exemptions and one of those exemptions is kind of one of our topics for tonight and that's healthcare ministry. That's where Kiro fits in, is under this exemption. That is a first person transaction again. It's a sharing model. Technically it's not insurance um, and they cannot say it's insurance, but I'll tell you it's like insurance. <laughs> um, and then also once again, you can go on to the open market. And I just wanna, you know, what it comes down to is that the best parts of the Affordable Care Act, including direct primary care services, are the exemptions. <laughs> They're all the areas that say, yeah, here's the stuff that was really working before. We're gonna carve out a little safe space for them, kind of like college campuses and free speech. We're gonna carve out a, a, free, a safe space for them and uh, let those grow. 
And uh, meanwhile, we're going to try to push all the marketing air towards all these other plans that don't work and nobody wants. Um, so the exemptions are what really works. But on the open market, just to give you an idea of some of the opportunity there, how many, how many of you actually heard of something called Surgery Center of Oklahoma? All right. Check out the website. For those of you who haven't, go to a website called surgerycenterok.com. And on that website, is a, you'll see uh, the first page is going to be a, a, human, a, a depiction of the human anatomy. And you can go with your mouse and click on any body part, and it'll tell you what surgeries are available for that body part and what the out-the-door pricing is for that surgery. When's the last time you went to an ER and started clicking on a, and said, here's how the price is? You don't know, right? These guys, they have the out-the-door pricing. And by the way, these prices can be as low as 90% off what you would pay in an insurance model. So a lot of people take solace in the fact that they have an insurance policy and then that's going to take care of everything. Finding is that you can actually pay a lot less um, without insurance because now deductibles are in the order of five to ten thousand dollars even after deductibles you've got co-pays or a, co a sharing payment or you're sharing the burden up to a certain level on it now if you actually start looking at the bottom line and actually say well hey can I save money by actually going off books I'm telling you in some cases you can and so go to surgerycenterok.com there's a lot of people that will actually pay for the price of a plane ticket fly out there, get the surgery, come home, and they still haven't met their deductible back here. <laughs> um, so there are innovative disruptors that are out there. And once again, the best parts of the Affordable Care Act are the exemptions. Okay, now why does this matter? And this is, this is near and dear to my heart. And this is where I started on this whole journey towards pursuing free market health care reforms. Now, DPC, as I said, has been proven to save on the order of 20%, just by itself, without any of the other innovative plans on top of this, because it emphasizes preventive care, keeps people out of the hospital for chronic care and for hospitalization. All right, so what does this mean to the state budget? So on Medicaid, right now, there's 2.4 million people enrolled in Medicaid in the state of Michigan. Thank you, Medicaid expansion. So I, uh, I've always believed that the measure of success for a program is how, uh, government assistance is how many people don't need it. And unfortunately, we've got some folks up there right now that are focused on how many we do need uh, or how many enroll. But the bottom line is the uh, Medicaid line item in our budget is the single largest line item in the state budget at $18.6 billion. If you can get a 20% savings on an $18.6 billion line item, Who's our, who hasn't been uh, tainted by common core math here? 20% <laughs> that, would be about 3.6 billion. Okay, I'll go more 3.7, but we'll go with that. That'll work. <laughs> Three point, yeah, 3.7. All right, $3.7 billion. Of that, the state portion is about $1.5 billion. Mm -hmm. So, you guys remember this thing called the Rhodes debate a while back? Mm -hmm. You remember how much they were, and additional funds they were looking for to pay for the roads? 1.2 billion, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, we don't need to raise taxes to pay for the roads. This one line item alone is 1.5 billion dollars against 1.2. So I'm telling you, uh, unfortunately what happened after the uh, road tax was passed is that they took 400 million dollars away from in general fund that was allocated to the roads and put it towards backfilling potholes and Medicaid expansion assumptions. <laughs> Um, but here's the end game. The nice thing is we actually have a pilot that so far has been approved out of the Senate Budget Committee and DHHS and the House. It's a pilot to prove out all these claims that I'm doing on direct primary care. I said, I'll put up and shut up, <laughs> you know, whatever. Here's a, we're going to couple direct primary care, provide that to Medicaid enrollees, and then show how it keeps people out of the hospital, keeps them out of the chronic conditions, and saves us money. And uh, right now it's slated for about 2,400 enrollees. And when it's all said and done, um, it's a three-year pilot. And uh, we'll go off and try to prove it out here. It's also one of the reasons I'm a big advocate of lump sum uh, Medicaid block grants at the federal level. Because if we have a lump sum grant, so that $18.6 billion, about 12, almost $13 billion comes from the feds on that. If they just give us what they gave us last year in our next coming budget, and we could find a way to actually go off and deploy it 
in a way that actually saves us money. That $3.7 billion gets pocketed here in the state of Michigan. We could use it for either income tax reductions, which I know is near and dear to Senator Brandenburg's heart. Um, we could use it for paying for roads. We could use it for uh, all kinds of different things besides you know, what we can't, uh, right now, we can't do some of these things because of the uh, strings that are attached by the federal government. So let's move into public employees. You know, in the state of New Jersey, not exactly a Republican stronghold, highlighting that this is not a uh, Republican issue or conservative issue, this is a bipartisan issue. In the state of Michigan, they have something called Our Health, where they're putting a pilot out for direct primary care for New Jersey employees. In the state of Michigan, we've got 51,000 state employees. We've also got local employees uh, for all our local municipalities and school systems. You know, we could save another $280 million, which means more teachers, more police officers, um, hopefully some tax reductions at the state level. Uh, so this is another option to go off and save taxpayers some money while, once again, improving the quality of care. So we're not rationing services. The way, the way some organizations, some insurance companies save money is by saying no <laughs> to, to care that people actually need. How many of you guys have seen the, t the uh, movie The Incredibles? All right, maybe not. All right, so anyway, there's a scene in there where you're supposed to say no on it. Well, that's how much, that's how money is typically saved in healthcare. That's not the case here. We're actually improving the quality. All right, last but not least, what if we extend this model and had Michigan uh, be a f the center of a free market healthcare revolution by having DPCS docs available all across the state, which is why I'm going around everywhere in the state. We have 10 million citizens. We spend about $35 billion in healthcare for private employers on, on uh, healthcare. 20% off of $35 billion. Come on, John, you ready? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I was wrong. I, uh, $7 billion. That's seven billion dollars that can be reinvested into new jobs, could be put into better paying jobs, could make the companies more competitive so that they can lower their prices. And guess what that does from an economic growth perspective? That, is a, that signals Michigan is open for business. We have all these targeted incentive programs that are going on around. Now you've probably heard about a few of them that are out there. Wouldn't it be nice to actually do a broad-based tax incentive that actually lowers the cost of biz uh, doing business, but it also lowers the cost of living for everybody else? This is one of the ways to go off and do that. All right, so I'm not going to go into, I'm going to leave it to the folks that are the healthcare experts in here in just a second, but yeah. <clears throat> On the previous slide, in all three of those scenarios, where does the money, where does the money come for, let's say, Medicaid recipients to enter into these cash transactions? Do they use their own money or does the state do it for them? So it's really not a first party thing? Or Under the model that I had for the Medicaid expansion alternative, it was gonna be they would put in their own money because frankly, you're gonna find out that a lot of the Medicaid enrollees right now are already using um, DPCS because they can't get access to a primary care physician. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you go to the Mackinac Center website, you'll see a a video showing specifically that. This is highlighting a Medicaid enrollee that uh, would pay $50 a month to go get access to this. Under what's being proposed in our pilot, the state would pay for that right now. Just go prove it out for them. And, uh, but um, it's, uh, anyway, so okay, I'll, just my question. yeah, no, it's, uh, unfortunately right now, the uh, federal government will not reimburse directly under CMS for direct primary care services. Matter of fact, I was testifying today before Senator Shirky's uh, uh, Health Policy Committee today um, on behalf of Senate Concurrent Resolution 10 that I uh, put forward. If, if passed, that resolution essentially becomes a letter to the federal government saying that the citizens of Michigan would like to be able to bill directly for direct primary care services to CMS. So we don't have to do this kind of kabuki dance on expenditures on it. It's all part of the overall coverage. In the state of Washington, when they deployed Medic, uh, DPCS in support of Medicaid, they had to get cute by making it a subcontract to their primary managed care organization. And so the managed care organization would get reimbursed by the feds, and then the managed care organization would pay the direct primary care underneath it. We're taking a slightly different approach in here. We're just going to pay out of the state coffers for the purpose of the pilot directly 
um, out of general fund for that. And then if the feds give us a waiver, an innovation waiver, which now we got some better people up there that are more innovative thinking, if they give us that waiver, that will actually help defray the cost of that pilot a little bit, but that remains to be seen. But that's a, that's a biggie and it's a good question because um, ultimately this is about lowering the overall cost burden, but it's also about improving the quality of care for folks and we think we got a gem here. So I encourage you to, if you really want to get a good overview of the healthcare landscape, um, this is a pretty, it's been a pretty popular article at Forbes.com, they published the mine. It's, uh, it's free market healthcare revolution, why and how. It breaks down a little bit of the history of healthcare and why we're in the shape that we're in, but it also talks about the solutions. And you've heard a lot of those solutions here today, but that's a good way of just summarizing it. Go to Forbes.com, and if you like what you see, please share it with everybody and let them know about it, and especially with your congressional reps, and make sure that they're aware of it and that you're excited about what, what you're seeing there. Also, you can go to morninginmichigan.com. That's actually senatorpatrickkolbeck.com. I just, when I get on the air um, and I'm on the radio and I say Senator Patrick Colbeck, everybody goes to stephencolbert.com. So, uh, <laughs> so we, we rearranged it. And notice there's no U after the O. So it's uh, morninginmichigan.com. Or you can contact our office to get a hold of Penny. But there's a ton of information on there. All the previous healthcare town halls that we've done are posted online there so you can get access to it. We go around with a rotating crew of direct primary care docs and healthcare ministries and self-funded insurance. The goal, frankly, is just to let you know what the options are. We're not, we're not saying go with this particular uh, group or anything like that. We're just, these are the experts that are actually doing it, so we want the experts to come out here and talk to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. One, what I keep hearing is that one of the big concerns and it's either a legitimate concern or it's an illegitimate attack point, depending on your perspective. But they keep talking about low-income people. Chicken salad. Yeah. And, and, Chicken salad. and how health care would be provided to people with low incomes. Yeah. So could you, and I think I can see the answer, but could you speak to that a little bit from this perspective? Yeah, well, f first of all, that Mackinac Center video that they did explains how um, for low incomes, Medicaid enrollee, which is typically between, uh, one, in this case, it was part of the expansion population. So they're about 100% to 138% of the federal poverty limit. So that's anywhere from what, 13,000 or so to, um, you know, 18,000 or so. Yeah, I don't know. It depends for a family, it's a little bit higher, like you said. Um, so this option actually, <coughs> goes off and supports them. So $50, $50 a month for access to a primary care physician, and a lot of the procedures are actually included inside. They've done studies, Dr. Seema Verma was out about four years ago, and I was out at a seminar she was involved in called Other Care, where we we're talking about all kinds of free market healthcare options. And she was the architect of the Healthy Indiana Plan, and it, which was HSA based. And she was very interested, by the way, in our direct primary care approach, coupling that with the HSA. Um, she had done some studies about what low-income people could afford for their health care. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was around 80, 80 to 90 percent of those on Medicaid in that expansion population could afford a minimum of $20 a month towards this end. And, uh, and you know, you can scale the, the services on this if you want. 50, $50 a month or $60 a month, you're treating a Medicaid patient exactly like you would treat anybody else. But I could easily go in there and prescribe a DPCS contract that says, you know, you get 12 visits a year instead of unlimited or something like that. And then anything else after that, you pay five bucks or something like that. You're still getting a pretty dang good... Still affordable. Right. So how does this differ, and maybe one of them would be the better ones to answer, but yeah. how does this differ from the concierge care? This is, yeah, and that's where Paul fits in because he's actually based his whole practice on serving the underserved out in Detroit. And so he's not only a smart doc, but he's a very caring doc and a very caring gentleman. So maybe it's a good time to transition over to my good friend, Dr. Paul Thomas. Yes, that's good. Now, do you want to? Thank you. We'll right. trade bikes. Hey, give us a few minutes here to transition. We're going to change out our uh, PowerPoint presentations and change the mic over, so. So musical interlude, yeah. <laughs>
go. Sorry. I hate to keep you waiting here. <coughs> Pat, are, are the Blue Crosses of the world going to let this happen? Yeah, you ever hear the expression, the price of liberty is eternal <laughs> vigilance? <laughs> We've already seen a couple attempts to kind of play in. We, I reached out to Blue Cross about three years ago on this, and I said, can you provide us with a wraparound prod product that doesn't interfere, that complements this? And um, I, I, we've got one insurance company that Priority Health on the west side of the state that's actually expressed interest in helping us on this pilot. That's why we got it out of the, out of the starting blocks this okay. time around. And I have a feeling once one comes in, that's the toughest stunt to crack, then opens it up for a few others to get involved. So I'm hopeful. 